Okay, good morning everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Richard Porter. I'm the Managing Director of Communications here at the EUBRD. Uh, it's just after 9am in London, 10am Central European time. And uh, welcome to the headquarters of the EBRD in London and to the 6th Western Balkans Investment Summit. Uh, we're joined uh, in the auditorium here by an audience of our, our guests and by those of you who are watching online as well. We have our panel of prime ministers from the region and we're going to hear from them over the next couple of hours. In the audience, we have business leaders and investors who will have a chance to ask questions of our panelists once we've got through the initial discussion. Uh, there is simultaneous interpretation in the room, uh, so make sure you have your uh, headset ready if you need one. If you don't have a headset, uh, please just indicate to the room attendants and they'll bring one to you. Uh, but uh, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce the president of the EBRD, Adil Renaud Basso. Uh, Adil, please join me here. Prime ministers, government members, representative of the business world, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the EBRD. I'm very happy to open the six Western Balkans Investment Summit at the EBRD and to host you for the first time in our new headquarters. Some of you attended the historic summit in the same format which took place with all regional prime ministers present 10 years ago. Since then, we have reconvened every other year of the year. We may need to reflect on how often we gather in the future, not least because there are now so many Western Balkan summits, which is a good thing. In any case, now a decade on from our first event, it's a good time to take stock of what we have achieved to, together. The 2014 summit effectively launched the Western Balkan 6 process at the level of prime ministers. Regional cooperation in this new format in a region with a very difficult history is now the norm. Western Balkans prime ministers have frequent meetings focused on many topics. And this sends a strong message to the rest of the world that this region has reached new levels of maturity and stability. Indeed, I would argue that such intensifying cooperation is one of the region's greatest achievements of recent times. And it is also important given the, turbulent, the memories of its turbulent past and also in the light of Russia's ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine and growing geopolitical tensions and political fragmentation elsewhere. Such cooperation is also a testament to the vision of the region's leaders. We will all listen carefully to the prime ministers as they explain their country's priorities for regional projects later on. I expect that you will hear a high degree of convergence between them. Progress in coordination between the Western Balkans countries has been matched by better cooperation with and among international donors, the European Commission and the international financial institutions. The result is a visible strengthening of the way we pool resources in support of regional projects, primarily under the Western Balkans investment framework. Under the leadership of the European Commission, better coordination has allowed many more important regional transport and energy projects to be prioritized. We at EBRD are looking forward to working closely with the European Commission and the governments of the region in implementing the EU Growth Plan for the Western Balkans. This EU initiative has the potential to be a real game changer in the region, providing new impetus for much needed investments and reforms. 
we support the new growth plans approach of bringing forward some benefits of EU membership before accession. We also welcome the increased focus on reforms associated with the plan. This is particularly important for us, the EBRD, because support to reforms is at the core of our transition mandate. Transition is not only about financing and investments, even if that is very important, but it needs to be sustained by efficient policies and economic frameworks. We have promoted regional integration by delivering several cross-border infrastructure projects that increase the free flow of commerce, competitiveness, and opportunities for export growth. Last week only, the EBRD board approved, and I will sign later today on the margin of this summit, the railway project connecting Albania with Montenegro. But there is more to regional integration than physical infrastructure. Further trade integration with the European single market is a key objective. The common regional market promoted by the EU would also offer substantial benefits for the regions, countries, and investors. The region offers great potential for investors with favorable corporate income tax regimes, a competitive labor force, and the clear prospect of integration into the European Union. The region's people are well-educated, highly skilled, and many are talented entrepreneurs. I've seen that myself on my many trips in the region, and I visited, I had the opportunity since I'm the president of the bank to visit each country in the region and meet with entrepreneurs, private sector, businesses, and so forth. As the largest IFI in the region, EBRD has invested more than 18 billion euros in the Western Balkans, and a record level of investment of 1.63 billion euros last year. We intend to continue scaling up our activities in the Western Balkans, leveraging on our network of six offices, 150 professionals on the ground to help countries to deliver on reforms and investments particularly in the areas of green transition, skills inclusion, and digitalization. The region has come a long way in the last decade, but there is still a big gap with the European Union. According to a new EBRD study on its convergence with EU living standards, it could take, at the current pace, between 40 and 70 years, or even longer, to close this gap. These are sobering findings. This is why, to speed up convergence, we need to combine our funding with private capital. So we've been working with other financial institutions and the European Commission to develop ways of doing exactly that, not least for major regional infrastructure projects, whether through PPPs or by attracting private investment in the energy sector. We are doing everything we can to unlock more investment in the regions. But we can attract much more of it if, at the same time, reforms are implemented. Such reforms represent one of the most reliable ways of re-energizing growth and transition. And there is a need for much stronger administrative capacity to absorb the support available to the region. In my opinion, the region should focus on three priorities. First, Western Balkan countries must accelerate their green transition. Further investment in renewable energy as well as in the electricity grids and greater energy efficiency would help strengthen the region's resilience to future energy shocks and its economic competitiveness. 
It is especially important if the region wants to keep pace with the ambitions set by the EU and to maintain a smooth access to the single market. We are proud of what is being done and the support we are providing to countries in the region to scale up solar and wind power generation through auctions to allocate capacities to investors. And we are pleased with the results that Albania and Serbia in particular have achieved in terms of securing competitively priced energy and attracting experienced international investors. We are looking forward to extending this support to other countries in the region this year and beyond. At COP28, I was pleased to lead a consortium of international banks and agencies to join with the government of North Macedonia in launching their Just Energy Transition Investment Partnership. This will support the country in mobilizing necessary investments to transition away from old polluting coal to a modern, competitive, low-cost renewables-based energy system. Second, standards of public governance should be improved by reforming, in particular, state-owned enterprises, fighting corruption, and leveraging digital technology. These reforms are key to instill trust, to protect economic stability, and attract foreign investors. Third, the region needs to be even more open to trade and investment. Deeper integration in global value chains is key for improving competitiveness and innovation. At a time of new trends and challenges in globalization, there are opportunities that the Western Balkans, with the proximity to EU markets and their competitive advantages, can size with proper frameworks. The EBRD has been and will be a stronger partners of all Western Balkans countries and our partners in this reform agenda. The Western Balkans countries have been part of the EBRD's success story since the bank was created. We have led the way on investment in the Western Balkans. And we are determined to help create the climate and conditions for even more. Today is another opportunity for us to recognize the region's many strengths. And then, together with investors, to, to turn those trends into real progress for its economies and, most importantly, its people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Adil. Um, as is now customary at uh, these kinds of events, we have a, a hybrid mix of, of in-person and remote speakers. Um, we're now going to hear two video messages uh, recorded for us, starting with Charles Michel, President of the European Council, on the screen. Dear Odile Renaud Basso, dear Prime Ministers, dear friends, this summit comes at a crucial time for the Western Balkans with fresh momentum in the EU's enlargement process. Enlargement is a top priority for EU leaders, and we are doing our homework in the EU to prepare for new members and to welcome you, our Western Balkan partners and friends, into our EU family, because your future is within the European Union. Your road to the EU started over 20 years ago, and now we know that we must speed up the process. We need to get ready on both sides. Enlargement is a merit-based process, and EU membership brings both responsibilities and benefits. To take on the responsibilities and to reap the benefits of a highly competitive environment, one needs to be ready. And this means putting into action EU-related reforms anchored in the rule of law and in democratic values. It also means resolving bilateral conflicts of the past, and it means being ready economically and boosting socio-economic convergence. Yes, there are serious challenges, but together 
we can achieve our common goals. We can count on international financial institutions to play a key role in driving forward private investment. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2020, we put into place the economic and investment plan for the Western Balkans. Over half of the 30 billion euro investment package has already been mobilized. And now we are adding the new growth plan for the Western Balkans. EU leaders gave a few weeks ago the green light to this plan. This is another powerful signal of our sincere commitment to the gradual integration of your region. This growth plan will enhance your economic integration with the EU single market. It will boost regional integration through the common regional market and it has the potential to double the size of the Western Balkan economies within the next 10 years. And of course, it will be extremely helpful to support your path to the EU membership. This growth plan comes with increased financial assistance worth 6 billion euros. It aims to bring the aid intensity for your region to 75% of the EU average by the end of this decade. Ladies and gentlemen, in the EU we sincerely appreciate the work of the EBRD in your region to support the real economy and to advance reforms and your role in helping to push forward regional integration and regional cooperation. Today's summit is a very good example along with your active participation at our annual EU Western Balkan Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, we live in times of unprecedented and interconnected crisis. Peace and democracy cannot be taken for granted. Our economic security and prosperity must be protected. When we join forces, we are more powerful. When we join forces, we are more influential in the world to defend our common interests. Together, we can build a safe and prosperous European future for our children. I wish you a successful summit and I thank you. So a very clear message from uh, Charles Michel there. And let's now turn to someone else with a strong perspective on this, the European Commissioner for Neighbourhood and Enlargement, uh, Oliver Farelli. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to address you today at the opening of the sixth EBRD Western Balkans Investment Summit, although virtually, as unfortunately, I cannot be with you in person. This summit takes place at a time of new momentum for EU enlargement to the Western Balkans and beyond. Following the proposals of the European Commission, the European Council took the historic decision to open accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova, grant candidate status to Georgia on the understanding that relevant steps are taken and open accession negotiations with Bosnia and Herzegovina once the necessary degree of compliance with the membership criteria is achieved. Last November, the Commission also proposed a new growth plan for the Western Balkans with double of objective of boosting the Western Balkans socio-economic convergence with the EU and in this way accelerating the accession process in this region. The plan is based on four pillars, aimed at bringing the Western Balkans closer to the EU single market, deepening the regional economic integration, accelerating fundamental reforms, and increasing funding. Together, these efforts will enable the Western Balkans to benefit from advantages of the EU membership prior to full accession. To drive these three objectives forward, we have proposed a 6 billion euro new financial instrument, the Reform and Growth Facility. One of the key platforms for the implementation of the facility will be the Western Balkans investment framework in which many of you take active part. I want to share with you that we have already started the work. Each of our Western Balkan partners is currently preparing a reform agenda, which has two components. 
The first part include socio-economic reforms, and the second part include reforms related to the fundamentals of the enlargement process that will allow them to benefit from these funds and allow private businesses to invest with renewed confidence in the Western Balkans. In parallel, the Commission has already identified seven priority actions for accelerated integration into our single market, which includes, for example, the facilitation of road transport and the integration and decarbonization of the energy markets of the Western Balkans. Once adopted, the funds would complement our existing economic and investment plan flagship investments and contribute to better connectivity links between the EU and the region. Concerning this economic and investment plan, we are well on track to mobilize around 30 billion euros in the coming years, which is around a third of the current GDP of the region. Throughout these years, we have had a fruitful partnership with the EBRD, for which we are grateful. Thanks to this partnership, we could implement 25 large-scale investment flagship projects so important for the region. As you are all aware, the bulk of the work to realize the growth plan or the economic and investment plan does not take place in Brussels or in London for this matter but we are relying on our Western Balkan counterparts to show strong political commitment and for their administration to implement the strongly needed essential reforms. In this work, our cooperation with the EBRD and with other international financial institutions is key to identify the reforms that are most relevant to advance on the economic convergence of the region. And to find these investments which are mature for funding in each country to advance on core policies of the EU in the region, notably to connect all capitals in the region, to build energy, digital and transport networks and support the youth and human capital development. This is the offer from the EU for the region and invite all our partners to seize these opportunities. I wish you an interesting discussion and look forward to advancing the ambitious plans for the Western Balkans together. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next stage. Thank you, Oliver Varelli, and uh, also to Charles and Michelle before that. But it's time now for our panel discussion, and uh, I'd like to ask our panelists to join me. Um, just to explain that four of our Western Balkans leaders are here with us, uh, but unfortunately two of them have been unable to join in person, and at short notice will now be taking part uh, via a video link, so you'll see them on the screen behind me. So first of all, Adil, if you could just uh, take your seat here, and then... Anna Benabic, please. And then we have uh, Bojana Christo is on video and we'll be able to see her in a moment. So Albin Kurti, please. Uh, similarly, Eddie Rama is going to be on video. So next in the room we have Milojko Spajic. Thank you. And then finally joining us uh, on the panel, uh, Talat Shaferi. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to ask uh, each of you to answer the first question we have. Um, please, if you could uh, limit your answers to no, than, no more than two minutes so we can get through in the, in the time we have available. And uh, I'm going to start with you, Anna. Uh, and the simple question, really, um, and relating to what we've already heard this morning, why should investors put their money into your country? Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, and I would like to <coughs> just briefly thank uh, EBRD for all of the support that they've provided to my country. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm happy to say that we share many joint successes. Um, Serbia is a country which has um, completely changed um, in the past, I would say, 11 or 12 years. If you, if you look at where we were back in 2012, our GDP, annual GDP, was about 33 billion euros. And in uh, 2023, our GDP was over 60 
nine uh, billion, uh, approaching 70 billion. And our plans, our growth plan uh, by 2027, which uh, the government, together with uh, the President of the Republic of Serbia, Mr. Aleksandr Vucic, presented to our citizens and investors as well, inviting investors to come and invest and have more and more of a public-private partnerships, and uh, as Odile said, um, uh, gets us to our GDP uh, of close to 100 billion euros by the end of 2027. We have fantastic workforce. We, in, we invest more than ever in education. We look to find to to um, create partnerships with the investors and private sector in general to change our education system. And we are investing more than ever in infrastructure, road, railways, uh, and energy infrastructure as well, uh, which means that in terms of invest in investment environment, we're building stronger and strong stronger um, business-friendly invest in investment environment, which also um, one of the testimonies of, of that is uh, the uh, most recent uh, Financial Times FDI intelligence report, which ranked as much as six uh, local governments, including the city of Belgrade, cities like Kragujevac, Leskovac, uh, amongst the top 10 uh, investment environments in Europe for 2024. And finally, uh, if you're looking for a place to invest in innovation, information and uh, uh, communication and, and technology, uh, artificial intelligence, biotech, Serbia is the place to be in uh, Europe. Uh, we have uh, seen the, uh, one of the largest growth in Europe in terms of uh, services. Uh, if you look at the period 2016 to 2022, and we were number three in Europe uh, in ICT export growth in the same period, 2016-2022. And again, together with DBRD, investing in additional um, inf uh, innovation infrastructure through science and technology parks across, from, across Serbia. Um, because what we are uh, looking for is really to be a kind of an innovation-driven technology-driven uh, economy, which is important not just for Serbia, for the, but for the entire Western Balkans. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, well, I can see uh, Boyana Christo on the screen in front of me. I, I, I guess all of you can see as well. So same question to you, please. Uh, why should investors put their money into your country? Thank you very much, dear President of the EBRD, Madam Odile, dear Prime Ministers of the Western Balkan countries, dear guests at today's Western Balkans Investment Summit. I would like to wholeheartedly uh, greet you and to uh, apologize and uh, say how sorry I am that I was not able to be with you today in London. London. But still, I would like to thank you for allowing me to talk to you via this video link since we are discussing a very important topic. As for your question, why should foreign investors invest in Bosnia and Herzegovina? I would like to say the following. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country that has achieved important uh, uh, progress in improving business environment in the past few years. We implemented strong reforms, we adopted some strategic documents, namely different laws and bylaws, whereby we improved our business environment significantly and created better conditions for foreign investment. That's why Bosnia and Herzegovina is open to foreign investors, especially uh, we have a special state treatment for them, which means they have the same rights and obligations as those living in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a desirable uh, destination for foreign investments, being an opened-up country where profit can be achieved, as has been proved by many investments made so far. And the main advantages of Bosnia and Herzegovina as an investment destination are the following. A good geographical position, availability of natural resources and beauties of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
long-term tradition of industrial production, a large number of available industrial zones, which are attractive sites, as well as of different production facilities, favorable laws, legislation that I have already mentioned, favorable for foreign investments, low taxes and low business-related costs, as well as well-educated labor force. Another thing that I would like to point out as one of the advantages is that our convertible mark, which is uh, the currency of our country, is linked to Europe. We also sign different uh, bilateral and regional trade agreements. Uh, at the moment, the perspective of joining the European Union is uh, yet another key factor for that, as well as establishment of the post-investment program for foreign investors. Taking into account all these important, uh, all this impro uh, important progress towards uh, integration with the EU, we are also harmonizing the, our legislation with the EU key, and we hope that that will further facilitate um, doing business in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'd like to mention that many investors are already doing very good business in the entire region. That's how they give important contributions to the economic uh, development, not just to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but the entire region. Investment projects are selected according to um, supply and demand. Uh, and they belong to different sectors. What I can say that in 2024, uh, in Bosnia, in, uh, in, by the end of 2024, we have the 20, uh, 223 investment projects in Bosnia, uh, mainly linked to three main sectors. Most of these projects concern agricultural uh, uh, production of food, 57, tourism, and energy for Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll, I'll turn now to my next guest in the, in the audience. Uh, good morning, uh, Arvind Kurti. Same question to you. Why should investors put their money into your country? Uh, thank you very much. In these uh, last three years, we have had uh, economic development, uh, democratic progress, and institutional stability which uh, helped us a great deal to successfully combat security threats, but also address uh, climate change and uh, social inequality. Um, Kosovo leads the Western Balkans in real economic growth projections from uh, 2023 to 2025. In the last three years, uh, average economic growth was 6.2% of GDP. And we have significantly improved in the rule of law and advancements in political rights, civil liberties, and electoral democracy. Uh, the positions, this positions Kosovo favorably on the global stage for investments, and we are located in the heart of the uh, Emena region, namely uh, Europe, Middle East, and uh, North Africa. We have competitive labor costs, a young and multilingual workforce, average age of the population in Kosovo is 31 years, and um, open market economy, which also underscores Kosovo's commitment to business-friendly environment. We are best placed for investment in the uh, tech sector. Uh, the Tech Competitiveness Index for 2023 for the emerging Europe regions out of 23 European countries, Kosovo ranks 11th, leaving behind all candidate countries for the EU membership and one member of the European uh, Union. In these uh, three years, we've doubled both exports and uh, uh, FDI for indirect investments. So uh, we need more investment, but Kosovo is very convenient for foreign investment because it's already happening. So we need more of the same, so to speak. And uh, our government is focused on rule of law, anti-corruption, uh, being fully aligned with the United States of America, European Union, and UK uh, geopolitically and uh, value-based uh, uh, approach uh, in terms of also doing business, especially after Russian aggression in uh, Ukraine that recently marked two years. And uh, domestically, one additional element that we work hard is to link labor market with professional education. We want to bridge skills gap 
So for every diploma in our schools and uh, universities, you get a job uh, in the market. Uh, we have started this project in uh, 14 municipalities, 21 schools, 12 profiles of uh, what Germans call Ausbildung. And we have learned this from our strong and emotionally connected diaspora, especially in Germany and Switzerland, who are bringing not just their remittances and investment, but also their work ethics and uh, know-how. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, so we're going to turn to another of our uh, guests on the uh, on the video line now, Eddie, Eddie Rama. Uh, same question, why should investors put money into your country? Why not? Uh, <laughs> I can uh, claim to be a veteran of uh, this format uh, since I've been uh, present from its birth 10 years ago. And uh, in 10 years, a lot has changed, not just the quantity and the color of my hair. Mm -hmm. Our region is uh, a different place on a good way. And uh, while the world is also a different place, but I'm not sure in which way. Albania has also changed a lot from a country with, uh, to say the least, a stigma of an unsafe place in a country that uh, last year reached uh, 10 million tourists, the more than triple of our residing population. We were then 10 years ago back a country 100% based on renewables. But uh, as we are the same today, the difference is that uh, our fully hydro based uh, energy resource is being diversified with solar and wind uh, while our completely broken electricity system which was on the verge of collapse back then uh, because of nearly 50 percent of the population not paying the bills today is in a totally uh, different uh, ship and uh, just to give you a fact uh, although as everyone else, we're under the terrible <laughs> pressure of the energy global crisis. Our uh, electricity price didn't uh, didn't change um, at all. Our inflation rates in the gloomy 2022 remained well below the levels of our uh, regional peers, and our public debt uh, has went down. Uh, in our historical under 60% at the end of 2010-23, after having reached a peak of nearly 80% due to a tragic earthquake and uh, also the pandemic back-to-back. Uh, -back. So as your president uh, stated in her open remark, uh, together with Serbia, Albania has been a very, uh, a very uh, good place for the increase of uh, serious foreign investors. So to the question why uh, investors should put their money in Albania, the simple answer is they should, because if they will not, others will. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so next, uh, back into the room, and uh, I'm going to turn to Malaiko Spaich. And, uh, well, you know the question now. <laughs> Why should investors put money into your country? Sure. I think uh, since the Russian aggression on Ukraine, uh, being a credible NATO member is, is a big thing. And uh, is, that, is visible that it's a big thing and Montenegro is a credible NATO partner. Second thing is that uh, Montenegro, by using euro, uh, we, are, we don't have FX risks. And uh, our assets, liabilities, revenues and expenses are all in euros, fully hedged, so, so that there is no FX risk uh, within the system. Thirdly, uh, fiscally, we are uh, within Maastricht criteria, both on debt to GDP side as well as the fiscal deficit side. We have been for the four, last four years, that we have had the lowest fiscal deficit in Europe uh, continuously. And uh, that has helped us to reduce the debt burden uh, to sustainable levels. 
uh, that uh, the philosophy, fiscal di philosophy that we cater in Montenegro is, is very similar to late Mr. Schäuble. We don't believe in economic growth uh, fueled by uh, extreme fiscal spending. We think that actually fiscal con conservative approach will help attract uh, the right investors to the country. Uh, we are very focused uh, on the next uh, six years. We'll be building uh, big uh, projects in Montenegro. We have nine sections of the highways. We have four sections of the railways. We have two airport projects and we have a port, deep sea port, uh, the deepest in Adriatic. We are also um, we are we are uh, progressing very fast uh, in our EU integration efforts. Uh, we have uh, been recently integrated within EU's screening mechanism for rule of law. I think we are progressing very fast there. And in terms of collateral enforcement and uh, investor security, I think we are leading the charge. And uh, it is uh, definitely important uh, having in mind the past practices, uh, uh, past practices not only of Montenegro but generally the whole Eastern Europe. Uh, to ensure that uh, investors are secure and feel secure within our country. Uh, also, I think that we have a very pro-business administration uh, in, in Montenegro now that understands uh, business very well, as evidenced by the uh, reform, tax reforms. Uh, the reform called Europe Now One uh, is, uh, has helped uh, us politically, but also has helped Montenegro be the most competitive nation in Europe together with Switzerland in terms of labor cost veg i.e. labor taxes and contributions are lowest in Europe uh, together with uh, Switzerland. Why is this important? Because uh, labor tax wedge is together with rent or the real estate cost is the biggest fixed cost of any business. So by doing so we are just reducing the, the risk side of investing in Montenegro, uh, the cost side of investing in Montenegro. So the, uh, uh, the, in terms of the other taxation systems, obviously we are following OECD rules and we don't want to be seen as a tax haven. So we have, uh, we are, uh, we have a global minimum standards uh, as, as, per other, as the other OECD nations. However, we think that, the, uh, that we can be very competitive and we want that our tax system makes sense to the businesses. So this is what we are really focused on. Uh, we have uh, one of the lowest energy prices in Europe. I think that's also extremely important for, and they are very predictable supply levels, uh, especially in terms of electrical, uh, electrical energy side. We have a huge potential of building additional capacities, uh, especially in renewables. We have uh, three low hanging fruit uh, projects in terms of the hydropower that all the NGOs and everybody agrees on that they are completely uh, okay in terms of the ecological impacts. Some of them have actually even positive ecological impacts. Uh, then we have a, a vast uh, number of uh, wind and solar projects as well. So we are hoping together with our export link to Italy, which is uh, one of the best ways to arbitrage electrical price now in Europe because you can produce it in Balkans or in Montenegro and sell it to the South Italy, which, is, which has one of the most expensive electricity prices now in Europe. These are like some of the low-hanging fruits for businesses to, to uh, take advantage of Montenegro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, for the last round of the uh, first round of questions, uh, Talat Javeri, would you please answer the question, why should investors put money into your country? Above all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be um, here and certainly, I would like to express appreciation to the European Bank on Reconstruction and Development. This summit is comprehended as an area to share our visions for the regions as well as the investment opportunities and the main regional projects. We all witnessed numerous changes in the regions, uh, in our region, uh, crisis, conflicts that directly impact the global economic. Here arises the first reply to the question why the foreign investment should invest in North Macedonia, and that is due to the disturbance of the uh, global supply chains due to the closeness to the European centers. North Macedonia is one of the destinations to established manufacturing. Our location is good, including the connections as well as the ports next to us, um, Thessaloniki, Duras, and Within short period of time, the manufactured product can reach to its destination. 
The second argument is the stable condition at the macroeconomic and fiscal uh, plan, the intensive process of harmonization of the national and the key communitaire, the beneficial business surrounding, including the well-developed programs for support of the investments, including the stimulative taxation policy in Terelia through the ratification of agreement of avoiding of double taxation and tax evasion. North Macedonia does not have uh, discriminating laws on foreign investors. We call them our investment investors because they all contribute to the single aim, and that is the improvement of the quality of life of our citizens. The third argument for uh, the, to your question is the uh, significant stimulations for the companies that work in our state. They include various measures, uh, subsidies for opening working positions, capital investments, subsidies up to 50 percent of the acceptable investment expenses for research and development, as well as support for the exporters. The low level of taxation of the profits of the corporative sector and the income of the physical entities, in other words, 10 percent of corporate tax rate, as well as the personal income rate, stimulates the growth of the economic activities and the investments. We have many, uh, num many numerous technological industrial development zones at, at the territory of our state that are especially attractive to the foreign investments. We have already adopted and implemented laws and bylaws that are fully harmonized with the European energetic community that provides liberalization of the energy market. We have started the negotiations with the European Union, and we are a member of NATO since 2020. This offers stability. We have uh, trade agreements with all 27 member states of the European Union four members of EFTA, seven uh, states of uh, CFTA, bilateral trade agreements with Turkey, Ukraine, and United Kingdom. I think that this is enough for the start and to underline the uh, facts as well as the need uh, to invest in North Macedonia. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So that's our, our first six uh, presentations, as it were. Um, of course, we have a, an audience of investors, uh, potential investors, people in the room here, and also many people watching online. Um, I'm just going to turn to Adil now, just for a, a question to you, having, having heard what you've just heard, and also because obviously you've, you've travelled to all of these countries. Um, is this what the private sector wants to hear, do you think? Is there something more that the private sector should be hearing from the businesses that you speak to uh, for improving the conditions for investment in the Western Balkans countries? No, I, I think what we heard and, and uh, is important in the sense of, I mean, in, and in a way it's what the private sector want to hear in terms of openness to private investment and looking forward and, and trying to, have, to uh, put in place the conditions that are uh, <coughs> conducive to private investment. And you know that one of the uh, way we work on that as a, as a bank is, uh, and we do that in a number of countries, um, in the Western Balkans is to support investment council where private sector can speak and explain what, what challenges they see, what are the obstacles, the hurdles they face in their business with the top level of, I mean, the prime, at prime minister level. And this is very often a good way to have a good dialogue with private investors and, and this is taking place in the region. I think that everything we heard about macro financial stability is a very important point because in a way it's a foundation for investment when a foreign investors is looking at where, you know, he doesn't want to be in a country where you can have a financial crisis, uh, debt, uh, debt uh, sustainability uh, crisis. So this is, and the commitment to macro financial stability is a very important one. Um, I think the, the clarity, as I was saying, the clarity of the strategy to be open to the private sector, to have a green strategy, energy, I mean, clear strategy for the development of the energy sector is a very important element, in particular for investors in uh, uh, manufacturing, ICT, because they want to be looking at the medium to long term. They know that they have to be able to show that their source of energy is green, um, and, and so it's very important for them to look into and to have access to renewable and, and so forth. This is, I think, is a, is a key competitiveness component um, looking, uh, looking forward. The question which is coming often, and that there are some progress, there is some further way to go, I think is governance, rule of law, fight against corruption. I think that um, 
this is and the, and the transparency of the framework. You know that that's um, um, transparency of auction, transparency. I mean, access or equal equal access to uh, to market. Uh, that's a very important element for private uh, sector investors uh, and connectivity. And uh, and that's why um, uh, all the effort put with the EU Commission support on developing connectivity roads, railway, but also digital connectivity is uh, is very important because Western Balkans are very well positioned geographically, very close to Europe with uh, uh, this perspective of being integrated in the EU, but developing connectivity is uh, is important and, and um, that's why for us also as, as the BRD we see that as a, I mean, a key area for investment. Um, and the last point I would like to say is to, I would like to say is to give opportunities. So, uh, developing, for example, pri public-private partnership is a, is an important uh, element. I mean, for investors to come, they are depending on sectors, but uh, in a, a lot of sectors, public sector, uh, public-private partnership in um, airport, water management, waste management, in uh, road, in infrastructure, that can also make sense. Um, in, uh, so that's a way to attract investors and to improve so the macroeconomic stability because then, I mean, the burden is, is uh, it, it reduces the burden on, on the state. The um, development of renewable opportunities with auction and so forth is also to so creating opportunities for private investors to be able to step in their investment in the region is um, is also very important. So I hear a lot of in the uh, prime minister statement and and uh, and presentation of the country a lot on these agendas, and uh, and I think that's a very strong basis for moving further, accelerating, and and so forth. And one last element I wanted to to say is that very often this presentation looks a bit like a beauty contest, everybody, but in a way. The progress made by each and every country is benefiting from the others. We talk a lot, I mean, I talked a lot about regional integration, and, and this is something we know in the EU because it's a bit of a, we have the same, I mean, you have countries, but also we have, I mean, the, the regional dimension, and I think this is very important to have in mind that any, I mean, growth and opportunities in country in the region will benefit the others because of the interconnection. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, after the next uh, round of questions, we're going to come to you in the audience. So if you uh, do want to ask a question to uh, any of our panelists, please uh, start thinking about what that might be. Um, but I just want to pick up on something that Adil just talked about, actually, briefly, which was um, connectivity, uh, which I think is, is one of the priorities you, you highlighted. And I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists again uh, a question in that area. So I'll start, we'll start with you, Anna Banabich, again. What are your government's priorities in the regional cross-border projects and perhaps you could uh, highlight three priorities if you'd like to. Sure, I would, I would say uh, uh, certainly number one, uh, roads and railways, uh, so infrastructure, uh, transport connectivity uh, and uh, we have already completed uh, the one of the most important projects which is Corridor 10 uh, connecting uh, basically Central Europe uh, to uh, uh, North Macedonia, uh, Bulgaria, uh, through Serbia. Uh, but we uh, continue to uh, build uh, highways to connect uh, uh, us to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, uh, railways to connect us uh, by high-speed railway to uh, North Macedonia and then, and then uh, Greece. Um, so in general, infrastructure development is uh, key priority. Uh, it's amazing to uh, see that uh, if you look at the numbers, only uh, in the past 10 years we have built over six, over 468 kilometers of highways. So only 468 kilometers in the past 10 years of highways. Under construction, over 643 kilometers and if you look at the, this is just highways. If you look at the railways, we have built a, a high-speed railway from, our, from Belgrade to Novi Sad, connecting two largest cities in Serbia. And uh, by the end of uh, this year, we need to, com con uh, to complete construction of the high-speed railway to the border with Hungary. And then by hopefully 2026, 
basically connect Belgrade to Budapest by high-speed uh, highway. And we have currently in construction over 200 kilometers of new uh, railway, so infrastructure. But then uh, uh, also energy, extremely important for sustainable growth and sustainable development. Uh, and we have just completed the gas interconnector to Bulgaria uh, to connect us to LNG terminals in Greece and to get uh, gas available f from uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, the next big project is gas interconnector to North Macedonia and also oil pipeline to Hungary. And number three is equally important in today's world, you have to build what I call digital ro road, uh, roads, which is basically uh, broadband. And uh, with the huge support from EBRD, we have started a very ambitious project, uh, which will mean that by the end of 2025, so next year, we have 100% of Serbia covered uh, by um, high-speed, reliable uh, internet access. And again, finally, I fully agree with uh, EBRD uh, president. What we need to show as governments is efficiency of the government, availability of the government, meaning that the governments are available to its citizens and investors literally 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year, as well as transparency, fight against corruption, all of that can be fit in one term that is e-government. Serbia, central Serbia, currently has 100% e-government. But you need to make it available to citizens and businesses, even in the most rural communities, meaning that you have to have rural broadband available everywhere. And with the support of EBRD, we are doing it now. And so we're going to have it uh, completed by, as I said, end of uh, 2025. And that is, I think, also a big strength and a key, one of the key advantages of Serbia. But to sum up, infrastructure, ro roads and railways connecting the region, uh, energy, and, and uh, digital uh, infrastructure, meaning rural broadband. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to go to Bayana Cristo next. Um, I don't know. Yes? Ah, oh, good. You are there. Um, so, same question. Uh, we're, we're talking here about uh, the, uh, your priorities in regional cross-border projects. And if you were able to mention your three top priorities, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. As for uh, the priorities uh, in the regional projects for Bosnia and Herzegovina, I should say that uh, we have a special emphasis on projects that concern using uh, renewable energy sources and that encourage green transition, as well as infrastructural projects that are of vital importance for inciting economy and con our connection, integration with the European market. Within the infrastructural projects that serve as a basis for all other projects, one of the key priorities is Corridor 5C. That's one of the transportation corridors in our region, which is a vital infrastructural connectivity that connects Bosnia and Herzegovina with the European market. Modernization, uh, the construction of this corridor will improve our connection with the European region and encourage trade and growth. As for 5C corridor, uh, there are continuous investments and cooperation with uh, partnership countries and international organizations in order to ensure smooth progress of this project of the implementation of the project. Another thing that I'd like to point out is the importance of uh, green transition as a key element of modernization of our economy. The priority in this uh, area of transition to green energy is improvement of energy efficiency, reducing of green gas, uh, greenhouse gases, and uh, the protection of the environment. 
from the point of view of Bosnia and Herzegovina and with regard to these reforms, I have to say that we in Bosnia and Herzegovina have a divided uh, um, responsibilities. Uh, we have different layers of uh, government that uh, are responsible of different things. So one of the important projects that Bosnia and Herzegovina has given full uh, support, which is South Gas Connection of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Republic of Croatia. That is one of key projects as well. As for the projects that concern development of rural areas, we must not forget the projects that are uh, meant to further develop rural areas by giving support to agriculture, tourism, rural entrepreneurship, and rural infrastructure. There are different projects that are relevant for uh, equitable uh, regional uh, development and reduction of inequalities. In this uh, area, in Bosnia, we should more Im implement some concrete measures in order to ensure sustainable economic development and strengthening small rural areas. These particular projects have a lot of potential, and I believe they can largely contribute to economic growth, sustainable development, and increase of competitiveness of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and therefore they should be further supported in order for them to be better in line with European standards. Finally, Bosnia and Herzegovina further works into achieving its uh, goals in regional projects uh, towards regional connectivity, uh, sustainable development, and stability in the entire region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to turn to Alvin Kurti in the audience, uh, in, the, in the panel. If you could uh, answer the question as well, please. Regional cross-border priorities. Uh, thank you. We need uh, investments on uh, both transport and energy regarding infrastructure, uh, roads, highways, railways, but also regarding energy, 1.2 gigawatts of renewable energy projects, which are crucial to uh, enhance regional connectivity and sustainable development, as well as education and human capital development. Over 7 billion euros of investment needs uh, targeted. Um, we have already accomplished the first uh, auction on a solar park 100 megawatt in the western part of Kosovo. Uh, publicly owned land, needed no expropriation of uh, private property. Uh, six corporations are competing. The bidding is closed. Uh, among 365 hectares, 100 hectares has to be uh, selected. And um, we have offered uh, 15 years of uh, power purchase agreement and 30 years of land lease agreement with a cap of 75 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, we are going to open another auction mid this year this time not solar but wind, uh, non-specific site, uh, two lots of 75 uh, megawatts each. Um, regarding transport, firstly with Albania, we are um, dedicated to building a railway connection between Pristina and Duras, uh, accompanied by the development of a dry port, dry port of Pristina with new port of Duras, uh, this project is pivotal for efficient transportation of goods and passengers, uh, promoting economic growth, trade facilitation, and creating a more interconnected and prosperous region. Um, feasibility study is showing that the best uh, line is the one which links uh, Jakova with uh, Škodra. Secondly, with North Macedonia, we want to improve road connectivity between Prizren and Tatov. Uh, we will need approximately a tunnel of uh, six kilometers, which is half on the side of the North Macedonia and half on the side of Republic of Kosovo. And uh, again, this is going to facilitate smoother cross-border movement, but also to strengthen our economic ties, cultural exchange uh, uh, and trade facilitation. And third, in partnership with Montenegro, uh, our focus is on construction, constructing new roads connecting West Kosovo with uh, Montenegro, 
pay and debt chain with uh, Rajoy, Plav, Andreevitsa, and uh, so on. We have recently established air traffic corridors with Albania and Montenegro, which contribute to safer and shorter flights. Uh, Pristina International Airport uh, this year uh, will have around 4 million passengers. Um, there are three major public infrastructural needs internally. Improving district heating in Kosovo by implementation of district heating system in municipalities with heating potential. Estimated investment needs are 466 million euros. Then construction of the motorway Route 7, Chav Duel Stime Lipian, 31 kilometers. Estimated investment needs are 425 million euros. And construction of Ibr Lepens, two rivers of Kosovo, uh, Lepens Canal and water reservoir of uh, Firai and Stime, approximately investment needs are 380 million euros. So um, on this occasion I would like to thank uh, EBRD for our close cooperation when it comes both to public works and to uh, private sector alike. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, Eddie Rama, back to you. And uh, the, the question is about regional cross-border priorities. If you could answer that, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna, gonna add to all these uh, strange names and directions that the audience is uh, filled in, uh, because uh, it's... Uh, Sounds a bit like a meeting of the railway uh, directors of uh, the region, but uh, I'm going to say very simply one thing, that uh, the regional cooperation has never been uh, more um, in development, also in terms of infrastructure and also in terms of other things. And uh, what I want to emphasize is the new growth plan of the European Union with the region uh, that implies, of course, uh, very strong cooperation among us, because uh, at the end, whatever we can come to London and say about how great is our growth, how great uh, is our export, how fantastic is our competitiveness, uh, we should always remember that we are too small to count in the global uh, Europe and uh, let alone the world. So uh, by opening the borders, by uh, interacting with each other in a much more uh, open and uh, much more um, convergent way, we can somehow count as a market. So for the investors, what is important is that when they come to the region, they don't come just to one country of the region, to a small market with its own uh, you know, specificities, but come in a much broader uh, space where the opportunity is much more based on true and real numbers, not just in few millions here, few millions there. And for that, of course, uh, investments uh, on infrastructure are very important, uh, by no doubt, and we are doing a lot of them. And uh, But as I said, I'm not going to count uh, and give uh, strange names to the audience uh, because uh, they'll get lost. So the, the most important is that uh, we have to push much stronger for this new growth plan with the green lanes, with the, uh, with the deleting of the non tariff barriers, and so on and so forth. Because, uh, let me give you uh, just one fact, uh, our trucks still wait in our borders a lot. Uh, 26 million hours. So uh, I'm not sure that this is a great place to be for investors that uh, want to have a much uh, more, uh, you know, comprehensive uh, market and much more uh, open uh, space of uh, opportunities and of activities. 
Okay, thank you very much. Right, well, let's uh, come back into the room. Um, and Have you got, uh, what's, what's, what's your way of answering this question, please? Regional cross-border priorities. I'll try to avoid uh, weird Balkan names, uh, <laughs> toponyms, uh, but I think it's important to note some of the projects, especially because for Montenegro, it's, it's extremely important to have fantastic relationship with all of our neighbors. And I think we are recognized as somebody who really invests huge efforts into uh, into getting uh, into ha into having a good operational working relationship with uh, everybody, and focus on the economy and economic development. So, uh, with uh, starting with uh, Croatia and Montenegro connectivity, I think it's even more so. It's about du connecting Dubrovnik and Kotor Bay. Uh, arguably the most two beautiful uh, places in Europe, uh, naturally and historically. I know there are many people uh, not really sure about that, but if you visit, you might be sure. Uh, so these two, uh, these two places, uh, we have a speedway project that we want to, uh, that we have already uh, went along with a preliminary design. Uh, and it's connecting Budva with, uh, with uh, Croatian border, uh, Kotor Bay and Budva. Then we have uh, a big G20 corridor uh, that was decided at the G20 meeting in, in India previously. Uh, it's uh, Adriatic Union corridor. Basically, it's a missing piece of a puzzle. Uh, and Adriatic Union corridor is the one that goes from Croatia, uh, from the Central Europe through Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Albania, Greece and Turkey, and further to the Middle East and India. So that Adriatic Union Highway project is an inter intercontinental project. It's also extremely important, strategically important. Uh, also, um, also extremely important one is uh, going from Bar towards North, uh, Serbia, Hungary, uh, Austria, Slovakia, etc. So this corridor as well is another highway that we are building. We have already started uh, portions of it. And uh, we have also with uh, Kosovo, we, ha we are uh, connected uh, with the highway going from Andrijevica towards uh, Pech and uh, Pristina and then further uh, to Mas North Macedonia, uh, Bulgaria, Turkey and so on and so forth. So that this is extremely important. And this one is actually a low hanging fruit because it's a really small missing piece to have a really good connectivity between Podgorica and Pristina and vice versa. Uh, then we have uh, another connectivity on the, of North Montenegro with Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have uh, population-wise also like it's extremely important for the for the groups living in North of Montenegro uh, to to be connected to Sarajevo eff effectively. So we have another speedway project uh, connecting us uh, Sarajevo, North Montenegro, and Podgorica, our capital as well. Uh, we do have uh, railway projects. Uh, EIB, BRD are helping us on uh, restructuring the, uh, the projects going from B Porto Bar towards the north, towards uh, Serbia, Hungary, and Austria. Uh, then we have two, high, uh, two airport projects. Hopefully this year we'll have uh, uh, IFC-led tender finalized and then we'll pick the winner and then we will have uh, the, the projects actually starting the end of, by end of this year. Um, and we have a deep sea port in Porto Bar. It's also very important for us. Uh, we understand there's a lot of competition for, uh, for uh, port traffic in the region, but I think we, we do have some very significant competitive advantages uh, uh, when it comes to the transportation, connectivity, and the types of, trans uh, types of uh, material that is transported through this port. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. So, uh, last answer in this uh, round of questions. If I could turn to Talat Shavheri, please. Uh, please explain your regional cross-border priorities. Thank you. Certainly, as the last to speak, I will reaffirm some of the statements of my colleagues. The Republic of North Macedonia, upon adoption of the law on energy, uh, has um, expanded the market of the energy. And in this context, we are attractive for uh, renewable resources investments, considering that the state has uh, over 250 sunny days throughout the years and uh, has a potential to use the wind force so that it can be used as a resource. It is of utmost importance to have the energetic interconnectivity with the neighboring states. We are uh, 
uh, we have an ongoing process for construction of the energy and energetic interconnected with the Republic of Albania. Thus, we are connected with all our neighbors. The railway infrastructure uh, and the road infrastructure is of high importance for us, considering that at the current point of time we are constructing the railway from Kumanovo to Bulgaria, connecting with Bulgaria the Corridor 8 and Corridor 10D that provides connection from a Union and Adriatic uh, Sea, which is important from the point of uh, strategic investments and in the context of the needs that we have taken over from the obligations of uh, NATO and the uh, logistics that we provide to NATO and the situation in the Black Sea and the Near East. In regards with the energy, we are working on the interconnecting pip pipeline with uh, Greece and the Republic of uh, Serbia, all in the context of our need to gasify the Republic of North Macedonia. And the projections we have made are in this regard. These are mainly the projects that I, would, I wanted to refer to. Uh, some of the projects with the Republic of Kosovo were already mentioned by my colleague Kurti. So in uh, our part, we have uh, ratified the bilateral agreement for the corridor, for the connection of the corridor 8 and uh, the highway arbor. Jafferi, uh, the finances have already been provided. Now we are looking, f uh, now we are in a procedure for providing a constructing, uh, constructing company, uh, thus connecting all the highways uh, together and contribute to the uh, intercommunication between the uh, states and increasing the investments in our region. So uh, I would not refer to the smaller projects that we have in our state. We have uh, many uh, projects that may interest, may be an interest for the foreign investments that are here in this hall with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're going to give uh, our business uh, guests in the audience a chance to ask some questions. I can see some hands up already. We have microphones around the room and uh, I think the lady in the green jacket, I saw your hand first. So uh, if you could um, uh, tell us who you are and, and who you represent, then uh, ask your question, please. Hi, I'm Tara Lindstedt from Innobat. A question for Anna. Uh, when will the new government be in place and will you stay at Prime Minister, Anna? <laughs> <laughs> I have the same question. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think the, the new government will be formed uh, very efficiently. I, I expect uh, uh, probably um, uh, during March, by the end of, of March. And, and then, uh, you know, I've already been the prime minister since uh, 2017. Uh, you know, uh, we, we will see. But, I, I, you know, I, I think what's most important for investors is that Serbia has a very, very clear vision of where it's heading and, and, and the way forward. And as I said, we have just in January promoted our plan for the future by 2027, uh, which entails uh, approximately 18 billion euros of investments in different sectors. Now, Combined with that kind of investment from the public sector, a lot of it will also come from the private sector through public-private partnerships. I think just that that shows you the scale of investments which Serbia is ready for in the in the next four years. So that's the vision, and then the the team will be implementing it as always. But I I do not think it's about personal uh, uh, you know solutions. It's it's about the team. Thank you. Okay, I think there's somebody right in front of you who had their hand up. Yes, just here. And then I'll come to somebody. Yes, it was you over here. I'll come to you next. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mark Bolan from Red Intelligence here in London. So I have two quick questions. Mr. Curti, does your 
plan to attract inward investment include a Euro bond issuance to put Kosovo on the uh, map of international financial markets, and if so, when? And to Mr. Spige, that last year the elections that brought you to power coincided with some financial outflows on the net FDI that brought FX reserves down to multi-year low 1.5 billion. So could you talk a bit about the nature of these financial outflows and if the low FX reserves increases the urgency of, uh, of finding an IMF program or a financial support from the EU? Thank you. Okay, so Alvin Kofi first, please. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, we have had uh, a very low uh, budget deficit, uh, the lowest in the region. We also have uh, decreased public debt. We have been very prudent with our finances. And we have had excellent relations with both IMF and World Bank. And uh, that can be concluded from their reports as well. So um, uh, Kosovo increased its tax revenues without changing fiscal policy. It increased also its uh, exports and FDI. Uh, annual state budget, for example, for this year in Kosovo is 35% higher than when I took office three years ago. So basically, uh, there is this financial stability across the board. And we have, in particular, invested in uh, four sectors, in um, uh, agriculture, defense and security, but also healthcare and uh, education. Uh, our uh, relation with Central European Bank is also uh, excellent. So uh, I just uh, can have optimism with enthusiasm for the times ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I misunderstood your question or you mixed it, mixed Montenegro with some other country because uh, Montenegro doesn't have, uh, a in essence, we don't have a central bank. We are, uh, we do have as an institution, but it's it's more of a bank regulatory agency rather than it's it has any mandate to to uh, print money to hold FX reserves because, as I said, we are using euros and we have done so unilaterally and we have been grandfathered in purely completely legally into into the eurozone. So we are quasi eurozone member. And we are, uh, in an essence, just to depict like in a vivid way, we are like a Frankfurt on Adriatic Sea, because Bundesbank is actually a central bank for Bank of Montenegro, uh, for for our central bank, and uh, it's all the transactions and everything is going through the Bundesbank and European Central Bank is basically we are fully in line with European Central Bank's policies. We will be uh, the first uh, SEPA member. Uh, hopefully this uh, as soon as possible, but, but I think sometime this year, and uh, outside of the e European Economic Zone. Uh, so I don't think I, I don't think you have got that one right, especially because 1.5 billion euros, that would be fantastic to have. Frankly, I don't think it's a low level uh, for a country of uh, 7 billion euro uh, GDP. 1.5 billion euros. Uh, 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 treasury reserves would would entail uh, uh, having uh, almost whole budget in our treasury reserves. So uh, another thing is we are uh, this year we have fiscal deficit fully under control. Uh, we have we are going to have execution of the budget below three percent fiscal deficit. Our debt to GDP, as I said, as well as the fiscal deficit, is already within Maastricht criteria. So I think that's why I'm saying we are quasi uh, eurozone member because we use euros exclusively, no other currencies. We are fully fiscally within the European framework. Uh, we soon will be using SEPA as well. So uh, I think the risks for investors are very low in that sense. Uh, I think our single B credit, credit rating or single B plus is, uh, is totally uh, unfounded as I was a credit uh, analyst myself. So I think, uh, I think soon we should see like some upgrades coming. Uh, I think we are definitely much more in the range of double B rated countries than in the single B rated countries. Um, yeah, that's about it. So please, if, if, I'm, if I misunderstood you, uh, please uh, specify some. Okay, thank you. So the question was just over here in the, uh, in the third row. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, concise presentations. My name is Ross. I'm here on behalf of LSBU. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, one question, um, I think, to Prime Minister of Serbia. 
because um, Serbia is the most successful country in the region when it comes to attraction of foreign direct investments. It attracts over 60% of all FDI into the region. Um, but as we know from the theory, from empirical evidence, and also from the recent EBRD report, um, FDI per se is not a catalyst for economic development, um, and there, there is no country where it was. So complementarity effect matters. Local businesses matter. So I would like to ask, um, what plans do you have or what policies do you have in place to support medium businesses to become large and more importantly to support large businesses to become multinational? Uh, can you name some private companies from your country which are also multinational and uh, globally competitive? Um, uh, if you allow me just one more question uh, for Mr. Corti. Uh, we know that some of the major economic powers in the world don't recognize Kosovo as independent state, but rather as an integral part of Serbia. So if based in Kosovo, how do we trade with India, with Brazil, with China? How do we import stuff? Uh, how do you manage those relationships? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, um uh, yes, we have had actually, um, we're basically attracting uh, uh, more FDI than the region combined. And we have since 2012, we have had every year increase in FDI attraction in Serbia, apart from one year when there was a COVID pandemic. Uh, and so every year was a new record high. Uh, and and the same was for last year, 2023. So now the record high FDI for Serbia is 4.5 billion uh, euros, uh, which is perhaps a little bit than, more than four times higher than 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, this helped us, well, together with supporting local businesses, startup uh, companies, um, micro, medium-sized companies, to create more than 550,000 new jobs in the past uh, 11 years. Uh, now, when you look at also, I was I was uh, looking uh, yesterday at the numbers of work permits that we issued in Serbia to foreigners who come to work in Serbia now again, uh, 2023. So last year was record high. Uh, we issued more than 52,000 work permits for foreigners to come and work in Serbia. In 2015, it was only 6,300. So that is the that is the scale at which Serbia is is basically changing. And when I say Central Serbia, this is the second time I'm using this term. I mean uh, Serbia, um, which uh, is basically not including in the statistic our autonomous province of Kosovo and Metohija which obviously we considered it to be part of Serbia. But this is politics, and now we're talking about economy, and it is important for me now to talk only about economy. Um, but in general, I think that you're right. A country can have a strong, vibrant economy only if it also has a in addition to successful FDI attraction, if it has a strong, vibrant local businesses. I am particularly happy to see that we have more and more startup companies, innovation companies, which actually decide whether the, com uh, the, the country is going to be successful and competitive in the 21st century. Uh, now, we have uh, a, uh, increasingly strong local businesses companies that are becoming multinational, such as MK Group, Delta, Mid Europa Partners, which is basically um, registered, registered in London, but has a, a, a basically a very strong base originally from uh, Serbia, and other companies which are very, very active in the region and, and now uh, uh, more so in, in Europe and across the world. Companies such as, that are not very uh, famous, such as Junior from Kragujevac in central Serbia, which is one of the uh, companies working for, for Swiss uh, CERN from Geneva, meaning they have the highest standard of 
high quality smart manufacturing or in mold which is basically in robotics exporting throughout the world these are the companies that as the government we are now basically supporting one by one to grow develop and conquer new markets through financial incentives, uh, development uh, fund, uh, uh, dual education, so that we basically prepare workforce immediately for these companies, not just technical high schools, but universities as well. Okay. Thank you. Alvin Kurt. Uh, first of all, our key trading partner is the uh, European Union, and we want to strengthen and deepen this uh, cooperation. Kosovo has been recognized by 117 countries around the world, uh, 22 out of 27 in EU, 26 out of 30 in NATO, and uh, three out of four members of uh, three out of four our neighbors recognize us. So Montenegro and North Macedonia recognize us, but Serbia uh, not yet. Uh, we don't have relations with Russian Federation. We have put sanctions to Russian Federation. We want Ukraine to win the war. We want Ukraine as fast as possible to come out victorious. And we need all democratic Europe and world to see Kremlin and despotic President Putin defeated. So we're not having cooperations with them. So even if they would want, we don't want. Uh, we have some import from China, but EU countries are our main trading partners. And uh, the name of my country is the Republic of Kosovo. It is not as it was referred here, uh, Kosovo and Metohia. If uh, I would continue down the same path, we would take a lot of your time because I would have to say, instead of Serbia, Serbia and Vojvodina and Sanjak and Toplica and Roška and Valley of Presheva and province of Timok. I think we should focus on economics. <laughs> okay. So, can, that, so, so let's uh, remember we're here to talk about investment in the Western Balkans. And I, we have, we've got three other panellists uh, who haven't answered any questions from the audience yet. So it would be quite interesting. If people have questions that they would like to put to the other panellists to give them a chance to answer, I would be grateful. So if your question is for uh, Bayana Christo, Edurama or Talat Jaferi, I would be interested in hearing that now. So is that your question, yes? Thank you. Hello to everyone. My name is Gradimir Stefanovic. I was born in Serbia, but I'm 30 years consultant in London. Of course, naturally connected with the Balkan, having projects in Serbia, Macedonia, and trying to make more projects in the region. What, what is my comparison with, uh, with other states, with other regions, is that we are, we, we are now I think 12 years or something like 12 years in the process of this Western Balkan conference, summit, whatever we call it, and the great support of EBRD to, to make more livable region. What I'm seeing that's, that, that might be a good idea to be considered, that Western Balkan could be formed or expanded in the format of combined authorities. In UK, there is a good experience, West Yorkshire, it's Western Balkan, uh, but uh, combined authorities sometimes easing life, easing disputes, and must be honest, softening political disputes. So the problem is a problem. The region uh, combined authority will make a modalities to sort out problem and of course it could be authorized to do it <laughs> not 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 regionally regional uh, so i'm seeing this as a way to improve investment in the region to simplify procedures in the investment to simplify procedure getting licenses or whatever it is for six countries it could be easy for some regional combined authority. Not everything, not all, of course. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll put that to one of the, um, uh, the panelists who hasn't spoken yet, and I can see uh, Bojana Christo, you're there. Would you like to maybe uh, have, a, have a go at answering that question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I didn't really understand this as a question, rather a comment as to how to improve foreign investments, how to deliver key projects relating to infrastructure, green transition that are of regional interest. So as I understood, through having a combined authority that will, it will help resolve uh, uh, this um, conflicts and uh, an authority that would help obtain permits, simplify procedures, and removing dilemmas. What I can say, and I'm definitely each country is doing it uh, from their own side, and we do that uh, within the our purview is to simplify our procedures through primary and secondary legislation. And I think that all of these countries in the region do, because we heard from all prime ministers that there is interest which uh, major projects are and what, where do would like to see investments in their country and firm commitment to facilitating uh, investment into regional infrastructure projects and removing uh, barriers. How and whether we will do this in this way, because each of our respective countries have so many commitments, each has its problems and views, but we could work together to have a single set of rules, all of us, to increase uh, FDIs every year. I will just mention certain things relating to Bosnia and Herzegovina. In 2021 and 22, uh, investments, uh, actually FDIs increased every year, and it continues to increase in 2023. With all of our complexities and procedures within our system of the country, in 2022, uh, the equity stake was about 14.9 million km, and other capital amounted to 3 billion. Uh, which would be a billion six hundred million euros. I would not bore you with figures from 2023, but what I would like to say and go back to what you propose, and our goal is to do everything in our power in each in our respective countries to ease investments, and we can have regional discussion of what we can do to uh, simplify uh, procedures. Maybe it could be difficult, the, bearing in mind the political situations, to have a single authority to uh, deal with it, uh, but there are ways to increase investment. Thank you very much indeed. And I see uh, Eddie Rama, I think you may want to come in on, on this question as well. Not necessarily if you <laughs> can, but uh, yes, as far as you are getting me in, I would say that what the gentleman raised in his question is, uh, is the essence, is the essence of all of it. Because yes, we have uh, made um, a long way. Uh, it's important to remember here that 10 years ago, uh, we had the first meeting ever of uh, the Western Balkan leaders together, not to talk about the past and to blame each other, but to discuss about the future. And this opened the way to the Berlin process. And then uh, Berlin process stumbled big time to deliver because it's a process that is uh, very well based on uh, the principles we should all follow. 
and the criteria we should all fulfill practically to get the region to the point that functions like uh, an integrated space where the four freedoms of Europe uh, work. Uh, free movement of people, of goods, of capitals and services. This is the essence. And then we created Open Balkan together with Serbia and North Macedonia, exactly because we saw that the uh, uh, Berlin process couldn't make it happen just for the simple reason that uh, these are things that have to be done together and have to be worked out every day because it's about a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of uh, papers to be dealt with. And uh, with the Open Balkan, uh, we succeeded to do some good uh, progress. Unfortunately, uh, the initiative uh, was uh, attacked and was uh, dismissed for totally bad reasons. Uh, because at the end, it was simply like a project implementation unit of uh, program and uh, it would have been great if we would have been all together but uh, you know it's uh, much easier said than done to bring all together now uh, the new growth plan is uh, in place uh, from the european union and guess what all they that is asked from us to do is exactly what has been uh, the principles of the process and what has been the effort of the Open Balkan. Nothing more and nothing less, plus, of course, the EU integration reforms. So it's all about free movement of people, free movement of goods, free movement of capital, free movement of services. And then coming back to the question of the gentleman is about, uh, about authorities. It's about uh, understanding and accepting that uh, for someone to move from one country to another country within the Western Balkans uh, should be as free as for European to move from uh, one country to another country of the European Union. Same for the trucks, same for, same for uh, the services and the capitals. And uh, this implies a lot, a lot of reform within our our states and a lot of uh, mindset change because at the end of the day uh, what we have been advocating and when i say we in the open balkans have been advocating since has been that uh, while we have to prepare ourselves for the european union waiting for the european union to prepare itself for us we have to do everything we can uh, in the region to be like a piece of land of the European Union and uh, working exactly like uh, countries work in the European Union. But then, you know, politics is politics. And uh, when politics is used uh, to get votes against this kind of uh, major strategic projects, then these major strategic projects have to wait. And uh, although in 10 years we have done a lot a lot, really a lot, and not alone, but also together with uh, our partners, allies, and so on. We could have done much more, and we have to to understand that uh, if we don't do much more, we will uh, lag behind. Whatever our our uh, numbers uh, and our uh, you know uh, local successes may look. Uh, because uh, we remain prisoners of some borders that are our own uh, obstacle towards the future. Okay, thank you. We're, we're moving towards the close of this part of the event. Um, I'll take uh, one more question again, a reminder on, on the topic of investment in the Western Balkans, if that's your question. Novi Kamarduk Vianello from Western Balkans Private Equity Fund One. We are the private equity fund for a small and mid cap investing in the entire region of Western Balkans. So I have a question uh, for everybody here. Uh, in order to invest in the region, and we are not discussing here about the foreign direct investment, we're discussing about the private equity fund that raised the money and then spends, in our case, 100 million in the entire region. Uh, we have to, as of today, work with private investors, namely in our case with family offices from Italy and from France, 
and then with institutional in investors, like in this case with like EBRD and uh, European Investment Fund slash bank, because European Investment Fund cannot invest in the region because it's outside of EU27. So we have to work with European Investment Bank and other institutional investors, including US um, and uh, EU. Uh, we have checked, and that's a question for you, we have checked in specifically in Serbia, in Albania, um, uh, Macedonia and Montenegro, and it is actually not possible to institutional investors in these countries to invest into uh, closed investment funds. So basically we cannot work with pension funds, with private pension funds, additional investment funds, insurances, banks, and so on, what we would call on the West institutional investors, because each of these countries' law is not permitting to institutional investors to invest in the closed investment funds. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, we cannot work with open investment funds because we cannot risk for somebody to withdraw the money tomorrow morning. So, specific question for each of you who wants to address that, maybe uh, Prime Minister Brnovic first. Uh, what are you doing to address the possibility so that on top of the assets under management that we are having, you can add also closed investment funds? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to put that to all of our um, panelists. And if I could just answer, ask you to answer briefly as well, because we're now very short of time. But starting with you, Anna well, Kornavich. Look, let me check this. Uh, and, and, you know, my, you're actually sitting just next to my team, so I've, I would like to ask them to take your contact details and we'll be in touch. Uh, I do not have the right answer for you uh, right now. But what I can say, actually, that is that I do understand how important access to finance is in Serbia. And as the gentleman asked to you, you know, relating to his question, uh, you know, said and, and, and suggested we need to push also uh, companies in Serbia. So if, you know, I, I can tell you that, for example, for as a country which is driving very, very hard, you know, ICT investments, investments in research and development, innovation, AI, biotech, to support that, we have actually uh, created two years ago uh, a specific fund in Serbia where we are attracting private investment funds, private equity funds, by as much as you're investing, we invest 50% of it. So to de-risk it in order to get more money into our economy and especially for, for our funds and our companies. So let me, let me check this and we'll get back to you. Okay, so uh, Bayana Christo, I'm going to ask you that question as well about investment conditions in your country. As for funds that you talked about, private equity funds, that they cannot invest into these countries, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, investing into closed funds is not regulated. So I cannot at the moment uh, tell you that there, uh, what are the legal preconditions and possibilities, uh, we will uh, send you a response based on the current legislation, what we can do to make it possible to invest through these uh, funds and attracting this type of capital. Thank you very much. Um, we are, uh, together with USAID, uh, building a new legislative framework for investment funds. This is an ongoing process where my Minister of Finance is very much involved. So a new legislative framework for investment funds, Kosovo government with uh, USAID. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that we need uh, deeper markets and we also need uh, education for investors. However, one uh, issue that I did not mention previously is the Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is an open fund, but still it is very important because um, we're going to bring together publicly owned enterprises and uh, also um, enterprises and assets from the privatization uh, agency of uh, Kosovo to restructure them, render them operative, profitable, 
but at the same time enable the public to uh, buy shares uh, because we consider it um, uh, as a great opportunity that also sovereign fund will uh, float uh, shares of these publicly owned enterprises and at the same time our diaspora citizens but also private businesses could uh, buy shares and could invest. So sovereign wealth fund is uh, becoming one of the uh, key elements of a driving force of uh, future economic development of Kosovo. Already we have put in place concept document of 80 pages and we have adopted in the second reading in the parliament an uh, adequate uh, law for sovereign wealth fund. Okay, thank you. I like it. So, um, as I was a fund manager, private equity fund manager myself, I can totally get what you're talking about. So actually you're able to do it uh, with uh, LLC structure, like uh, with a, it's synthetic, actually exp synthetic exposure to what you actually want to have. So it's doable in Montenegro even now. However, that said, uh, we are working on our leg legislation on changing the pension fund structure as well as uh, d during this legislation, we're going to change different structures and different possibilities for private equity investors in Montenegro. I think you, you guys will be pretty happy after this reform is passed. Uh, so you would have pro something comparable to Singapore, a Singaporean uh, model. And what else is, I think, is, ex is extremely important for private equity investors is collateral enforcement and security of your investments. Uh, we are setting up an uh, uh, arbitration court. It will be like MIAC, like a SIAC in Singapore. There will be a quick dispute resolution mechanism. Within six months, you would be able to uh, enforce the collateral and uh, exercise your rights. So I think this is something this, that is extremely important for private equity and all other private investors when they consider a country. So, and this one will have a juris, juris, both uh, common law as well as continental law jurisdictions because it depends on the judge. We'll bring like retired judges from, from UK, from Hong Kong, from France and other nations to help us set this uh, ad hoc institution that will fill in the gap because I think the commercial courts, not only in Montenegro but generally in the whole region, are not really to the fullest extent serving the purpose of, uh, uh, of what they should do. So I think uh, we are trying to kind of have this mid-step until we developed our commercial courts and the judicial system to the extent of the European Union. This mid-step is going to protect all of your rights uh, in Montenegro and in the region. Okay, thank you. I skipped the order actually. I should have gone to Eddie Rama as well. Eddie, Eddie Rama, are you there? And are you able to answer the question, please? Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I really understood uh, the question. So um, I would say in general that, uh, again, we are talking here about uh, how wonderful we are and how great it is to come and uh, what an incredible experience will be. But uh, at the end, I think that uh, it's up to the investors to see our region has a very special opportunity, I must say, because it's far less, still far less bureaucratic than the European Union or any country in the European Union. It has much more uh, space of uh, maneuver and of imagination allowed than in the European Union. And uh, it's today the time to come because uh, more and more people are coming and this is not anymore how it was 10 years ago that we had to wait for foreign investors like uh, you know waiting for rain in the desert and uh, who comes first will uh, make a very good uh, decision and will make a very uh, profitable profitable uh, investment and this not me uh, talk here, but it's the facts uh, of all of them that have invested. That overall had a good uh, a good uh, result uh, in Albania or in the other countries. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, we can take every blame, but not the blame that we are not letting the gentlemen there go to eat and listen to us for so long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and, and finally, uh, Talat Javeri, how, how would you like to respond to the question? 
pa smeten dhe ka osë në një tëtë. I think that the primary uh, reply is the very question and the dilemma that was posed. That as a fund, they cannot directly occur at the market and they go through the different financial institutions. This is a limitation for all of us in the essence. Um, because of the reasons, because our relations are regulated with the uh, European institutions and the world investment institutions. You've said, you've mentioned uh, our states, including uh, the Republic of North Macedonia, there are liberal funds that are limited with the capital uh, they should have in regard of using the funds, as you've mentioned, we certainly need them, uh, and we, we have comprehended this, and through the screening that we have been through, we have realized that we, have ad we need additional legislation in the framework of the European Union. We are drafting such a law in North Macedonia that is in a procedure in the ministries and through the government should be adopted at the plenary session at the parliament. This is a law or alternative um, investment funds that will provide the opportunity to sanction the uh, or to uh, regulate the uh, opportunity to, uh, to have investments from the funds that you are referring to. There is no other alternative, as you yourself uh, said, but the initiative that we have heard before uh, made us uh, draft the law uh, that we are making at the current point of time in our government. In other words, in the ministry, there is no other alternative at the moment that will be more appropriate for our state. Thank you to the uh, audience for the questions. Thank you to the panelists. We, 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 uh, we've covered big picture and down into the detail at the end there. Um, let me just say a few things about what happens next before everybody leaves. If you could just bear with me for a, for a brief moment. Um, there's a break now until um, 11.30. Uh, refreshments are being served immediately outside here. The green energy event, if you're attending that, will begin in the boardroom at 11.30, and uh, my colleagues outside will direct you to, to the room where that's taking place. And then from one o'clock, you're welcome, uh, if you're here, to join our networking buffet lunch, uh, which is being served in the space outside here until 3 p.m. So thank you very much again. We're going to do an informal photo now with our panellists. If, if you wouldn't mind just remaining seated while the photographers sort themselves out and then uh, we close. So thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you.